Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk about the reverse engineering of and hacking of Echovax robots. Uh, thank you for being here at this time. Um, I know it's kind of loud, but uh, I hope we figured it out. So um, before we start, um, I would like to introduce ourselves. Uh, so first, uh, I'm Dennis. I'm a security researcher or, you know, also a hardware hacker. Um, and I'm primarily looking into wireless and embedded security and privacy. So I try to look at any device which kind of is interesting for me. So I try to reverse engineer everything which is kind of basically around us. Um, you might know me as a vacuum and uh, IoT collector. So I have like probably six, over 600, 700 IoT devices and 60 or 70 vacuum robots. I start counting. Um, and my general goal is to get root access and root uh, vacuum robots. Um, I have also a website uh, which is called robotinfo.dev where I try to kind of document what kind of hardware uh, is in the robots, what kind of software is running, and what kind of methods exist for routing. Cool. Hi, I'm Braylon. Uh, I hack things for the Leviathan Security Group during the day, but this talk is entirely personal research and does not reflect their views. Uh, my general focus has been application security and APIs for quite a few years now, but I started robot hacking during COVID. Just for fun, I took apart a broken robot vacuum and tried to hack it. So now I am hardware hacking for fun, uh, mostly looking at robots, cameras, and smart locks. All right, so um, let's talk about the goals of this talk. So generally what we try to do is that we want to give you some understanding about the security and privacy risks of IoT devices. We want to give you some overview on how we did uh, vacuum robot hacking. Um, we want to show you the vulnerabilities and how to find them. And typically, our general goal is to get somehow root access without to disassemble the device. So there has been some past research on that. So um, if you hack this kind of niche products, the good thing is you can probably get like every year, or every two years, like an nice DEF CON talk. So we uh, basically, over the last five, six years, we kind of like, um, you know, use the topic and uh, it, it keeps giving. So if you find your niche product, um, just go ahead with that. This, this will be very rewarding. Some disclaimers. Um, so we do not claim that vendors are using the sensors to spy on you, but, you know, they could technically do that. Um, the other thing which we do is like we primarily cover physical attacks or proximity attacks. Um, so we don't necessarily like attack devices through the cloud. Um, one thing which we want to stress always is like many vendors have problems and it's basically independent of origin, size, market share. But in this talk, we especially like focus on Echovax. Um, and all this research is basically part of private, uh, private projects. So there's no sponsorships by companies. There's no organizations behind that. Um, any statements are our own opinion and we are not representing anyone. So what kind of devices are we covering in this talk? Um, so basically uh, we're covering uh, Echovax robots, which you see on the left side up to the X2, um, and we're also covering uh, um, lawn mowing robots and the air purifiers, so the AirBot series. Um, technically, we also apply the, all the stuff which we do also applies to Yidi, because Yidi is basically a, um, a sub-brand of Echovax. And we only focus on devices which run Linux, so no dumb robots, so only cool stuff. So about the Stark, well, this is basically the result of five years of research and experiments, and technically we're not the first ones or the only ones who do research on Echovax. Um, the vendor knows about most of our findings. Um, they tried to fix some of them, but failed. So they failed very sadly. Um, and for other vulnerabilities, which are really, really, really bad, they, for whatever reason, have chosen to ignore them. Um, also here, I want to give a shout out to Chris Anderson, who uh, also found uh, independently all this stuff. And we, at some point, connected to each other. We are like, oh, wait, yeah, we know about this vulnerability. We know about this vulnerability. So there's probably way more people out there who know about that stuff. Um, typically, that kind of things are like a collaborative effort. So um, on the right, you see a picture where we were at a CCC camp in Germany and we we're just, you know, messing with the lawn mowing robots or uh, we were hacking um, the cameras uh, of the robots in India. So let's start with the motivation. Why do we want to root devices at all? Well, one of the things for us as hackers is, well, we want to play with cool hardware because that stuff is kind of cheap. Um, the other thing is um, we want to obviously stop the devices from uh, uh, constantly phoning home. Um, a lot of people have like a very good like smart home automation system, like Home Assistant, and they want to use that instead of the cloud. Um, also, one thing which becomes more and more important is like the rate to repair. So basically, if you if the device is broken, we want to figure out what the reason is, and it's easier to you know figure it out if you have root access. Also, we want to verify the privacy claims of vendors because vendors you know they they, they say a lot of things, but it, it's not necessarily true. So why do we don't we trust the companies? Right? 
So one of the things with IoT devices is we are connected to your home network and we have internet all the time. The communication to the cloud is typically encrypted and you have no idea what we're actually sending out. From our own experience, we know that uh, developing secure hardware and software is extremely difficult. Um, and in the past, we caught vendors basically with some shady behavior. Um, the other thing is these devices, I mean, they not only have cameras, but nowadays they more and more have microphones. So, and the question is like, why do we need that? Generally, if you have cameras, well, there's some risk uh, with that. And um, devices might store pictures indefinitely. And from our own research, we know like that some of them do, and both in the cloud and locally. Um, and the other thing which we run into is like if you buy used devices from you know eBay or Amazon, you you don't know if the previous owner installed like a rootkit onto that. So as a new owner, you have no way to verify the software, and as a result, you might have a malicious device in your home like which spies on you. Um, so basically, root access is more or less the only way to kind of figure out that the device is clean. Um, speaking of vendors, there happened like this story around, um, I think one and a half years ago, where basically iRobot got caught that they were like, you know, making pictures of people and selling them to Venezuela for, um, you know, labeling them by gig workers. Um, and the other thing is, well, these devices contain a lot of data, so um, companies are very interested in like, you know, collecting data about your homes. And one of the rumors was that Amazon was trying to buy iRobot, not because of the great robots, but because of the data. Um, one question which we will answer later if you can relay, uh, rely on uh, certifications because all the devices which we have analyzed like in the last two, three years have certifications including Echovax. So um, I want to give you like a very brief overview of our hacking journey so far. And uh, for me personally, everything started back in 2017. Um, I was giving a talk at uh, the CCC and at DEF CON. Um, and this was a work together back then with Danny Wigema. And we targeted the Xiaomi vacuum robots, the first generation, and the Roborock. And the over-the-air update system was completely broken, so we were able to just push like local firm updates. Um, then it became a little bit more complicated, so the vendors kind of locked on things. Um, for the newer Roborock devices, we had to basically figure out a custom bootloader tool, which required teardown. And uh, we were kind of like slightly annoyed about that. So back then, we took a first look at Echovax. Um, and after my CCC talk back then, um, some influencer gave me like a Echovax DBOT 900, which he got from Echovax. And this had a very, very early firmware with the bug symbols in there, which was very, very helpful. Um, one thing which I figured out back then is that the firmware is unprotected. TLS is completely broken. There's no integrity protections. You can root a device via man in the middle, and you can just push like malicious OT updates. But one of the problems was the hardware was extremely weak, so it wasn't really interesting for us. Um, and as a result, we never published the results on that because, I mean, why would we? So over time, we had to develop new methods because it became more and more difficult to, to root uh, uh, Roborock and Xiaomi devices. So in 2021, um, I released a method for uh, newer like Roborock um, devices and also Dreamy. Uh, by the way, the CyberDog is a Dreamy device, technically where we were able to bypass secure boot and some security features and we were able to root it again. And it became again complicated in 2023. Um, we were looking again at Dreamy, Roborock, Novel, and Shark and figured out a secure boot bypass through like some bootloader magic. The issue with all of these is um, finding new routing methods become very annoying and it takes a long time. For the last one, we need like basically like multiple months. So we tried to find like a new vendor which we you know would attack again. So we went back to Echovax. And by that time, Echovax started to release more and more powerful devices. Um, and they were very similar to other devices, um, but they were lower priced. So this is like perfect. So one of the first devices which I analyzed back then was then the uh, DBOT X1. And basically, as soon as I unpacked it from the box, it took me like exactly 30 minutes to basically get root access and have a modified file system on it. So this was like a perfect target for future endeavors in, uh, with that company. Uh, independently of that, as mentioned before, uh, Braylon was messing with Echovax and Yeti, uh, Yeti robots, and so it found very similar things. Um, one thing which I need to address is like a lot of vendors, they saw my, uh, my talks and they started to obfuscate or like, introducing countermeasures against our routing attempts. For example, Shark Robot uh, or like their contractor, they kind of just like were hiding vias and everything. So they upgraded, we upgraded too. Basically we got an X-ray machine and now we started to just X-ray things because it's faster than like just measuring through like traces. All right, so let's talk about the Echovax um, ecosystem. So why do, are we looking at Echovax generally? It turns out that this company is fairly old. They were founded back then in 1998 in China and they produced initially like uh, OEM vacuum, ro uh, vacuum cleaners. Um, they introduced their own brand of vacuum robot in 2007 with a D-Bot. 
Um, and in 2020, we had the market share of 17%. So this was the basically la latest number which we were able to find. With, we, we couldn't find a newer number. And so back when we were second to iRobot. But the global market share is way higher nowadays. So we, we assume that we're probably like probably the f top two or top three uh, manufacturers. So their, their market cap, uh, cap is like five times higher as iRobot. Um, they produce a, uh, a bunch of uh, different products. So, for example, vacuum robots, which is kind of you know what you would expect. But they have also window cleaners, which you know clean your window. They have mobile air purifiers. Uh, we have lawn mowing robots, and we have some other like, products. So let's take a look at the hardware. Well, so typically, if you look at the hardware, we kind of try to figure out okay what's going on in the device. And so what we have on one side is the SOC, which is basically uh, running Linux. Uh, it's responsible for navigation, mapping, and connectivity. So it's connected to the storage. It has like access to sensors like LiDAR, camera, microphones. Um, it has like the connectivity, so Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and ultra wideband in some devices. On the other side, we have the MCU, the microcontroller, which is responsible for all the retail operation stuff. So controlling the wheels, uh, infrared sensors, uh, fans, and drop sensors. Typically, you, wanna, you want to have your drop sensors in real time operated because you don't want to wait one second until the robot is already flying down the stairs. So you want to do that in real time. Um, all right, so one of the first devices which I saw I mentioned uh, back in 2018 uh, was the DBOT 900 series. This was like basically like a rock trip with one core, 128 megabyte of RAM, and 256 megabyte of NAND flash, so not great. Uh, Sensor-wise, we had back then LiDAR already, infrared sensors, but it was just too weak. So even if you have root access, there's literally nothing we can run on that because it runs out of memory. Um, thankfully, later on, they started to kind of put like more performance chips into it. So um, the X1 in this case uh, was um, interesting and cheap. And they recycled from there on the hardware for multiple generations. So for, for us, it makes sense to kind of look into that because we basically could repeat our knowledge like on newer models. Um, in our example, um, the, um, the, the X1 was also interesting because, uh, because it had a station. Um, so this both station and robot were creating their own Wi-Fi network. We had a voice assistant, so microphones, which is always good. And we had a remote view feature, so you could access the camera remotely, which is always great for hacking. Um, if you take a look at the hardware, um, it's more or less the same hardware as the X2, so the newer generations like which we have here. And um, it's based on the Horizon X3 SOC. So this is a, a quad-core ARM. Uh, Cortex A with like a Cortex R in, in it, and it has also AI acceleration on, on the same chip. Um, they use 2 gigabyte of RAM, uh, 512 megabyte of SPI flash, and uh, a GD32 MCU, which is basically like a copycat STM32. Um, the X2, by the way, they use EMMC flash because they figured out they don't have enough flash, so we kind of need more stuff. One chip which was especially interesting for us is they have a special chip for voice uh, processing, which is a Baidu AI chip. And it has its own firmware, and they supposedly use it for breaker word detection, but who knows. So let's talk about the sensors. Um, well, the X1 has a LiDAR sensor, which is kind of cool. It has a microphone array, for whatever reason, or for the voice assistant, but I mean, why would you use it? Um, and it has camera and line lasers, so basically to detect objects in front of it. Um, and it has obviously a lot of infrared sensors to kind of detect if it runs into something, if it like drops from somewhere, or if it you know runs over your cat. Uh, a device which is very, very similar is the AirBot Z1, which we call the SpyBot, out of reasons. Um, it was released last year. Um, it's based on the same design like as the X1, but it has one additional camera and six microphones. And the features of that is, well, you can use it as a Bluetooth speaker, which follows you. Uh, it's, it's an air filter and humidifier, and it can do has a, a home patrol mode. So it will drive around in your home, and if an intruder gets, gets in, it will kind of alarm you. Uh, the thing is, you can also use it for, uh, to talk to someone at, at home, and basically, if you walk away, the robot will kind of follow you and kind of focus on your face. Um, the cool thing here is, you basically get two robots for the price of one. Uh, what they did is they basically recycled their old robots. So the top uh, part of the air purifier is basically an X1 a vacuum robot. The bottom part is an old 900 uh, series device. And there's an Ethernet cable which runs through the whole big thing, which connects both of them via Ethernet. So, very efficient. So, let's talk about the lawn mowings, uh, lawn mowing robots. Um, they have been released uh, in 2023 in Europe, and uh, this year, I think recently post CS this year in US. Um, it's kind of cool because they have for navigation GPS, but also they use visual and time of flight cameras, so they can kind of create a point cloud, and they use ultra wide um, ultra wide band beacons to kind of navigate. 
And feature-wise, you know, you can put an LTE module into them so they, you can connect them from, you know, if, even if the Wi-Fi doesn't have, uh, you know, connectivity. And again, they have a remote view and patrol function, so they will patrol your garden. Um, now you might be paranoid and say, like, wait, I don't want to, you know, a company like watch my garden. Of course, don't worry, they're certified. They say, like, yeah, um, you can watch your garden, patrol your garden, but th your data stays safe and we are certified because we use encryption and stuff. If you ever run into the issue to reverse engineer device, um, devices like that, be prepared that you need a lot of space. So uh, this has been a lot of screws, um, and it took like hours and hours and hours to disassemble it, and even more hours to reassemble it, and two screws were missing, and I, didn't, I still don't know where we are. So um, always keep track of your screws. So if you take a look at the, uh, at the lawnmower, um, it, it has an um, octa-core rock chip SOC with an AI accelerator, like a GPU, basically. Uh, 4 gigabyte of RAM, uh, 16 gigabyte of EMMC flash, and it has multiple MCUs. So uh, it has a display which you can control. It has its own like STM32 like uh, display. I tried to run Doom, but it doesn't have enough flash. So, um, and also even the knife assembly, which kind of controls like the the cutting, it has also its own MCU. Sensor-wise, it has a 360 degree camera on top. Uh, it has a front camera. It has a time of flight uh, sensor. Uh, has rain detectors, it has bump switches, so they, they kind of like put every sensor in there which you can have. Um, thankfully, um, they gave us a lot of debug ports, so all the models since 2019 have very similar debug ports, uh, which give you UART, 3.3 volt, SWD, and USB. And uh, it's easy to debug, and you can root the device or get root, a root shell, basically, without breaking any of the warranty seals. Cool, now let's talk about some of the software that Echovax employs. So these things run on Linux OS. They're basically just a mobile Linux server. Uh, they are using ROS Melodic Morenia for the robotics portion or handling. Uh, they also have a custom like software suite called Medusa. And there's a couple of interesting software packages that are uh, on the robot, including Python 2.7, which is very handy for hackers. They also use the AWS Kinesis SDK for uh, remote camera access outside of China and the Alibaba Aliyun SDK for remote camera access inside of China. So the good thing is that there are little to no protections against rooting, which is what hackers like. So let's briefly touch on some AI models that they're using. They use TensorFlow and OpenCV for detection. Uh, some of the typical objects include furniture, cables, pets, and pet remains. Uh, the lawnmower also can detect small animals and face recon, but on the right is a screenshot of our favorite um, object that it can detect. <laughs> so just wanted to touch on firmware updates. Uh, we've been keeping track of their firmware updates since we've obtained the robot. The, it, the US version was released in 2023, and they have, why did that go so quick? <laughs> Uh, they had been uh, putting out like monthly firmware updates since since then, and they stopped in March 2024. So we're kind of questioning if this is the end of life for this like pretty new product. Their change logs are also not very informative. So uh, we we have a theory that they are dropping device support very quickly, which is unfortunate. So the mobile app structure, there's a there's like a core app the Echovax home app. And then when you uh, add robots, it, the plugins are downloaded dynamically every time you add one to your account. So uh, now we'll talk about security and privacy. So when we first started researching Echovax robots, we wanted to see if they had like a bug bounty program. And this is the only page that we found for their security program. Uh, they claim that they have like a public bulletin board if you report bugs to their just kind of email address. They want you to email bugs to them, which is not like a secure method to do that generally. So yeah, there's no real collaborative bug bounty program and they don't respond to our reports or emails. They just kind of ignore us. <laughs> Some bugs are silently patched. We've, not we've noted that their privacy policy, it doesn't, there's no guarantees that the data stays in your locale, which is kind of scary. Uh, uh, re regional AWS services are used for the EU and US and China, of course. Some photos and videos are sent to Ali Cloud Video for AI analysis. In certain models, they claim that you have to opt in. I'm not sure if they honor that, but more research is needed. But 
Of course, lots of telemetry data is collected, as with most IoT devices these days. So what are we concerned about? These vacuums have microphones and cameras, so can they be enabled remotely without user notice? And where, where's the data sent to? And of course, we need to be concerned with AI and privacy. So why do these robots need face recon AI models? And is this telemetry data being used to train their AI? So uh, after Dennis's DEF CON talk last year about RoboRock vacuums, they posted this really interesting blog post titled, Can Robot Vacuum Cameras Be Hacked? And they claim that their cameras are like encrypting all data gathered by the device, but uh, who knows? <laughs> so they boast a bunch of multi they boast a bunch of certifications from Two Rhineland, which is that costs quite a bit of money, and they claim to be meeting and exceeding all standards. They even have like a splash screen when you load their mobile app, claiming that they meet ISO standards. Again, not in line with our findings, which we will talk about now. So. Data harvesting, uh, the, mobile, the mobile apps and the robot are pretty chatty. Just a lot of communication with the EchoVac servers. Their key data collection API endpoints are called big data and data upload. So it's not like they're hiding what they're doing. <laughs> they're pretty upfront about it. So some example of telemetry data that's collected are live coordinates of the robot location in your home, Wi-Fi access points, network data, and additional debug information is sent to Echovac servers if the robot gets stuck somewhere, uh, and possibly AI pictures even if not opted in. So what are they retaining in their cloud? Maps and pictures are stored in a NoSQL database, so anyone who knows the object ID of the map can access that data. There's no access controls on these points of information, which is, I don't know, I don't want random people with an Echovac account to be able to see a map of my house. Uh, the maps associated with the robots, it, they seem to remain on servers, even if you do a factory reset or repair the device to a different account. Also, deleting your actual Echovax account has no effect. The map remains indefinitely on their servers, even if you supposedly remove all of your information from your account. So, oh, what's wrong? Oh, sorry, skipped over one point. Um, Oh, the JWTs that are used for authentication are also, they also remain valid after you delete your account so you can continue using your account even though you deleted it. <laughs> and access to the robot is still possible. So not ideal security. So what are they storing on the device? There's a user data partition and it's not encrypted, of course. Why would they encrypt that? There's lots of logs, configs, maps, and pictures that are stored on this partition including the live video pin, which is stored in an MD5 hash, and the robot lawnmower, the lawnmower robot pin, which is stored in plain text. There's also Wi-Fi credentials and your neighbor wi neighbor's Wi-Fi access points, so they're kind of just mapping the whole world with their, their robot vacuums. There's also the Hello Yiku travel log, traffic logs, which are, that, that's their voice assistant, so keeping track of what you say to your robot. So always keep in mind that if you're selling a used device that even if you factory reset it, there's a risk to your privacy. And additionally, flash wear leveling will always be a problem, but that's for a different talk. So one of our big findings was that they did not configure their TS TLS properly. So the Echovax home app, mobile application correctly checks certificates but the robot specific plugins don't always do that. So the plugins sometimes accept self signed certificates, which is very risky to use on an insecure Wi Fi network, like at an airport, hotel, or the DEF CON open Wi Fi. Please don't do that. Uh, there's no warning or error shown in the app. And the t or this traffic will leak your authentication tokens and will allow the attacker to have access to your account for up to seven days and access to video feeds, like everything. Here's an example of the traffic that we were able to intercept. We've uh, redacted the, the authentication token just for good measure. <laughs> and additionally, they misconfigured TLS and their robots themselves as well. The MQTT and TLS connections, they accept self-signed certificates on some devices, which 
uh, allows for man in the middle attacks and over the OTA updates can be injected. Uh, it's for, the tool that we use for this is Cert Midum by Apple Oxman. It's highly recommend it. It's pretty pretty fun. And this is partially one of the reasons why this is happening. They are running bash scripts from the robot with no check certificate on wget. <laughs> Not ideal. So another thing that we found was that uh, the robots have audio warnings when the camera is accessed from the mobile app at the start of access and every five minutes afterwards. Uh, a sound file is played. So the problem is that local local sound files are stored on the data partition, which isn't encrypted and can just generally be accessed. So the sound files can be deleted and replaced. Uh, so we can replace the warning audio with an empty file. So nothing will happen when you access the live video feed, which is it will tell you why that's a huge problem in a second. So <laughs> so this finding was reported at CCC last year, but they fixed it and then we broke it again. So we're going to tell you about it again. So the app allows for live video and audio access on the robot. And this functionality is provided by AWS Kinesis. The owner and shared users of the Echovax account can access this feature. It is protected by a pin and the pin will be asked for before connecting. And it can only be changed and reset by the account owner and the reset requires account credentials. So here's how the pin works. Mobile app will ask the user for the pin. Uh, the Echovax cloud will act as a kind of broker. So now we ask the robot, hey, does this pin, pin hash match with your local hash that's stored on the robot? If yes, the robot decides that it is correct, sends that response to the mobile app, and then the WebRTC session over AWS Kinesis will be started and both will join the, the AWS Kinesis session. So what happens if the pin is incorrect? We go through that same process, but with an incorrect pin. Why are... Sorry, I don't know how to use PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, so... What is it doing? <laughs> I okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so we want we asked ourselves: Are the pin verification and WebRTC session tied together? So why is it? <laughs> this is really annoying. Why is it doing this? <laughs> Okay, sorry. Animations have a mind of their own right now. Oh. That's fine. Just go to it. It's going to slides by themselves. I can't stop it. This is entirely automated. There's like a button that's pressed down right now automatically. Sorry for that. Uh... Can you just turn animations off? I don't know how to. <laughs> okay, it's just... No, it's not. Oh. This is so dumb. <laughs> anyway, the, the takeaway message here is uh, we don't know why the animations are broken, but uh, basically it doesn't matter if the pin is correct or not correct. You can convince the app that the pin is still correct and we'll just establish a session. Um, and we have a demo here. Um, do you know how to say it? Dennis disabled the tracker. Sorry, I swear it worked before. <laughs> oh my god. Why is it not automatically? Have you ever seen that? It might be on its own.
I'm just trying the slideshow again. I mean, they're yeah, fine. Try. I think there's something yeah, to try this slideshow. Let's see something. This? That starts from the beginning. No, no, this one. This one? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we have automated slides for some reason, so we're just going to work with it. Okay, we can't work with this. Fuck me. Why is this happening? This is really awful. Maybe it was soon. Is it working now? Okay, now it's working. Okay. Uh, trust Microsoft. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so, right. So, as we were trying to go through, um, oh my god. I had to try. Okay, so we're trying to verify the pin, but the pin is incorrect. So are these tied together, the WebRTC session? So can we intercept this request or the response that pin is incorrect and tell the app that the pin is actually correct? And the answer was yes, we were able to do that. So now we have a malicious session and we have an AWS Kinesis stream. So can we bypass that altogether and just patch the pin query out of the app. And again, yes, we were able to do that. But we just want to make it abundantly clear that this is an issue with uh, Echovax's implementation. This is not an issue with AWS. So don't sue us AWS, please. So in short, the pin protection, pin protection is implemented in the app, but it's client-based authentication and ACL enforcement. So the robot doesn't keep track of successful authentications. The log of the video stream access relies on the honesty of the app. And this is really bad in combination with the TLS issues that we just touched upon. And it's even worse if the sound files have been tampered with. So here's just a video demo. This was reported in 2023. An unsuccessful fix was pushed. Uh, some plugins were updated and no firmware fixes, which is where like the real problem was. So we can downgrade the app with a, a bad plugin and it still works. So here's just a quick video demo. This is just Burp Suite. We have some find and replace queries to simplify it. Uh, we enter a wrong pin 111 a couple of times. Not the right pin. So we continue. Then we enable our find and replace queries in Burp Suite. Enter again the wrong pin. And we are dropped into a video streaming session and successfully bypass the pin mechanism. And here we are. Cool. So? All right. So let's talk about free lawnmowers. Who wants a free lawnmower? OK, now you learn how. Uh, actually, please don't. <laughs> We're not free. Um, so um, the ECOWAS G1 um, has an anti-theft mechanism where basically if you pick up the robot and you, um, you, know, you, need, and you don't trigger the alarm, basically, you need to enter a pin to unlock it. Um, as an owner, you can also enable alarms. So basically, if you pick it up or if someone picks it up, some alarm will go off. The problem here is, well, the pin is implemented basically in the SOC in the Linux operation system, and the pin is stored just on a plain text file on the, on the robot. Um, the thing generally with lawnmowers uh, is um, that other lawnmowers have the same issue. So as a general recommendation, uh, do not keep your mowers outside unprotected. And um, you know, we kind of hope that uh, Echovax and other vendors would somehow find a more secure lo location for the pin, for example, like in one of the MCUs, so to kind of you know, have a better blocking mechanism. So uh, let's talk about our main point today, and this is the uh, Bluetooth remote code execution, which we found at some point last year, um, which we were hoping that we would patch until today, but we didn't. So um, what's it about? So new vacuum robots and all lawn mowing robots so far uh, use BLE, uh, Bluetooth LE, basically for their provisioning. So if you initially like kind of want push your Wi-Fi credentials onto it, they have a mechanism for that. Uh, for Bluetooth, uh, for lawnmowers in particular, the Bluetooth is always active because we use it as a fall, fallback way to control them. And uh, for vacuums, it's typically active for the first 20 minutes after booting, and every time they reboot in the middle of the night uh, for like memory cleaning purposes. There's also a different way to kind of force a robot to reboot remotely, but we don't want to talk about that yet. 
So um, the communication between the app and the robots uh, over Bluetooth is, is uh, done by the GA, uh, the GAT protocol, basically. And the payload is encrypted with a static AES key, which is something similar. It's not exactly that one, but it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight Echovax, like, like something of that nature. Um, and the input validation of whatever happens with the data afterwards is, let's say, not great. Um, and that's kind of bad if you think about that they kind of say like, oh, hey, our robots have cameras, but trust us because we have been uh, certified by the TÜV. Um, so, and as a quick reminder, these devices have cameras and microphones. So let's create a, a payload. Um, first, what we want to execute is basically, uh, we want to play the boot, uh, boot uh, music, which you heard before on the robot. So we take the command, which causes that, uh, be embedded in some JSON payload, and we generate uh, um, encrypt the payload. Um, the payload looks something like this. Uh, basically, there's some a bunch of hack stuff. Um, what happens if we send it uh, to one of the robots? Um, basically, uh, it will receive the payload. It will decrypt it. Um, it will basically extract uh, one particular um, argument from there, and will generate a command line and put the argument which we which is extracted into the environment into the environment variable there. So the command line which we get at the end of the day is something like this. As you see, we basically use command injection there. And then it will happily execute a thing as root. And we tested this attack basically over 50 meters distance and uh, even longer, like 100 meters for uh, lawnmowers because we have a more powerful uh, Bluetooth antenna. So, and we have a demo here um, for like the uh, G1, which is like the, uh, the lawnmowing robot. What we do here is um, we send the payload uh, from an Android phone and you will see that we will get a succession back in a second. So we're sending a payload now. We saw it connected back to us, a reverse shell. And now we can type on the robot and, you know, we see that we are root. Um, we see what kind of version we're running. And so the robot basically connected back to us. Um, we have also another demo, uh, you know, more of the robot, but I will skip that uh, out of timing issues. Um, and we have also a live demo potentially. Which takes one. Okay, I skip that too. I will do it. Okay, we have three minutes left. So. Um, what can you do with that if you have a, a BLE code, uh, a code execution thing? So what we thought about is like, hey, how we, can we chain that? So generally, if you live in a very close populated area, there might be more Echovax users because especially like Echovax is like one of the market leaders. So what we can do is like we just attack an initial object like a vacuum robot, uh, sorry, lawn mowing robot, put a payload onto that, and then the robot has all the tools which it needs to talk to other devices. So it can infect the next robot which it has in distance, and that one can infect again the next one. And then it becomes a problem because the third one might start to infect back the, the, um, the lawnmower. So um, we just had it as a proof of concept. We didn't want to have, have a whole routing protocol to figure it out. So, you know, sorry about that. Um, let's talk about routing very, very quickly. Um, so there is a lot of uh, countermeasures in there in the software. They use a lot of X or in byte shifting to hide strings. Uh, they have a lot of anti-debugging features. For example, they detect LD preload in debuggers. And they use, for some of the devices, not all of them, um, Secure Boot and Android ver Verified Boot. So to get a root shell, well, you can connect over UART, but the problem is every device has a different password, and it's hard-coded, and it's, uh, sorry, it's not hard-coded, it's set at uh, boot time. Um, and the function is very obfuscated, um, but there's one particular tool which generates that, and this is how it's basically generated. So they take a bunch of like random MAC addresses probably from the developer's computer at some point, put the serial number in there, the model number, create a SHA-256, and then make it base64, and that's the root password. Uh, if you want to generate it for your own robot, um, there's a tool you can just go there, just enter your serial number, it will kind of give you a password. Uh, for firmware updates, uh, they're encrypted but not signed. Uh, the key is kind of gen dynamically generated, and it's like was kind of very difficult to reverse engineer it. But it's basically AS two uh, one twenty eight, uh, and this is the format string which they use to kind of generate the key, uh, which is like some someone's random email address. So they use like a bunch of random stuff, mix it together, and that's the AS key. So um, as mentioned, uh, some root file systems are not protected, so we can just modify them, especially on X one and Z one. Uh, we can just repack it and have like our own system. One thing which was kind of interesting for us is uh, we can get persistence in auto start. Uh, we left the debugging feature on some of the devices where uh, if this auto start folder exists on data, which is not protected, you can put a shell file into it. It will just happily execute it next time. So it's not protected in any way. So it's, it's persistent forever. Um, problem is, for, for whatever reason, on some of the devices, we disabled it. On some of them, not. I mean, it's kind of random. If you want to be persistent over factory sets, well, um, they only delete the files. So what you think you, you can do is like basically, um, because we don't recreate a file system, just make files immutable with uh, chatter. And that way, you know, we will stay there forever. 
Okay, I will talk really quick about the takeaway lessons. First, can you rely on certifications? No, you can't. Bad news. Um, if you have vulnerable devices, um, like the lawnmower, make sure that you turn it off until we push a fix. Um, don't use them if uh, turn them off if you don't use them. For devices which don't have BLE, um, don't, just don't update them if you want to keep root access. For vulnerable apps, don't connect to DEF CON open. Um, bad idea. Uh, use devices, be very careful with use devices. They might come, from, come with a compromised firmware. It's very difficult to verify. Um, if you do factory set before selling, you know, do that definitely, but be aware that it might not help against everything. Um, one thing, choose your partners wisely. You can use these things as stalker tools. I will skip that real quick and just finish with the summary. So we have a root access on most of the released, or I think actually all of the released Echovex robots. So we can use the UART interface and authentication to get into the device. We can use the BLE remote code execution right now to gonna get initial access on devices remotely, hopefully your own. Uh, you can get persistence and run some custom firmware on some of the devices which don't have protections. We were able to verify uh, the claims of the vendors and um, you know, we found a lot of like uh, security and privacy issues, and this both applies to the app, robots, cloud, and the certification for whatever reason even didn't prevent that. So I am not a firm believer in certifications nowadays. And uh, but this allows you uh, to look further into IoT devices and into AI, and so hopefully uh, this will uh, be for our security, for everyone's security. Uh, some quick announcements. Uh, I would like to thank Daniel, Chris, Azuan, Tim Starr, and Apple. And if you have any questions, I think we have time maybe you have time actually okay you can ask us questions when we're basically done uh sorry for the problems um thank you for being here um if you have any any other questions like a remote uh these are our email addresses feel free to reach out um yeah thank you very much